You're watching the new Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. Hello, everyone out there in the new Stack land. I'm Alex Williams, and I'm here with Kevin Loffridge who's working with Google, but has been with Deloitte for 20 years. Does that sum it up? That's correct. Great. And so we're here at Google Cloud Next, and beforehand we were talking a little bit about the keynotes and how new this topic is of AI. And it's now not just AI, but it's something you didn't really hear about last year. You may have heard a little bit about this topic of AI agents. And I'm curious on like how you communicate all of that information to the people who you talk to on a daily basis who are just trying to figure this stuff out. Sure. You know, it's interesting. I, agents is the new buzzword. Now, a year ago, we were talking Gen AI, and I think they're, they're similar, but the differentiating factor on an agent is really, can it do something in which it's pulling information, it's summarizing it, it's doing the reasoning associated with it, and then we're actually driving an action. So it's not just a, I'm going to summarize. So if I think about some of the technology out there today, like a chat bot, I ask it a question, it gives me an answer. I need it to do something to really be an agent, whether that's send an email, whether that's actually process an invoice. And that's where Google is starting to go, which is they understand for AI to be really useful, especially in like the enterprise software market, we need these agents to do things so we can get value out of it. And then we can deploy those things into business processes, whether they're things like order to cash or whether we're actually taking financial services and banking transactions and processing them with agents. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. So we, we may have talked to Deloitte a few times over the years, and I think most people are familiar with, you know, generally that you're a consulting firm. Sure. Um, but a lot of software engineers and developers are building it themselves, right? Um, I'm curious on what you all do. Like, how do you fit in to that engineering world? So, half of Deloitte are engineers these days. So what we started off as really an accounting firm and a tax firm and a management consulting firm, still has the audit, still has the tax, the management consulting firm we still do on strategy, but we've pivoted to continue to be a really large technology delivery firm. And within that, we have conversations on, just like our clients, on a buy versus build. And so do you go buy a platform, uh, an AI platform, and actually deploy it and then build custom things within it? Or do we start to build on our own? And uh, in what we do with our clients is we really start to have the conversation about where do you want to put your investment? And so in places that a client is going to have um, customer differentiation, we're really strong and say that's a place to build. In a place where it's more commoditized, like uh, IT service request or things where everyone's doing that, we really recommend on a, on a vendor buy, and you, you let the vendor actually do that for you. And within Deloitte, we do a very similar type of thing. There's some places where we go build custom uh, capabilities because we think it really is helpful for our special sauce, and other places we're buying vendors and, uh, and using it right out of the box. You're buying vendors? We're, we buy vendor services, yeah. Buy vendor services? Yeah. So you talk to the startups out there? We do. Do you buy their services? Sometimes. Like yeah. every, everything, it depends on does it fit within the strategy. Uh, sometimes we'll partner with startups and actually take them to clients with us because they have a unique set of capabilities. Uh, it really depends on what are we trying to solve at that moment. So from an engineering perspective then, what are you looking for now that, for instance, a ISV might offer? What are some of the trends and topics that are interesting to you that leads you to companies in particular categories, and what categories might they be? I'll go back to the keynote where they talked about the agent-to-agent -agent protocol. We're extremely excited about that because it's an open protocol that allows us to connect multiple ISVs together, multiple different software companies, so that we can actually stitch together business processes. One of the things that we see, and so again, mm -hmm. Deloitte's business is very much supporting large industries to solve problems. You can't be monolithic. We have to play within an entire ecosystem and we need agents that actually communicate and do things together because it's not one, we never have one agent or one solution that solves the entire business process. We call it a string of pearls. I need lots of different solutions. Sometimes they're robotics. Sometimes I have actually data analytics and data modernization I need to do. Sometimes it's agents. And if I stitch those things together, I end up getting a much better outcome for that specific business process. So, 
how do you see that all reflected today? Like, what is it? You talked about the A to A protocol. Why is that important to you? What is it significant about it? Companies have been built in their IT tooling for decades. Ripping and replacing everything isn't possible. We need to fit within an ecosystem that is mature, that is stable, and that works. Agent to agent allows us to connect existing uh, into existing solutions without having to replumb the entire enterprise. I'm really excited because we're going to have to change how companies interact and work, and they will drive. You know, we see AI that will help drive efficiency and speed, but we need to be able to work within an existing set of technology. Having an open protocol like A to A allows us to do that. Having it supported by Google who's a industry leader in terms of uh, AI and actually can drive this change and other ISVs jump on that same protocol, I think is really important and it, it's exciting for our business and for our clients. So what is model context protocol to you then? Um, I'm going to pass on that answer. I don't actually have a good answer for you on that. You don't? No. Are you familiar with it? I'm familiar with the term. I'm not sure. I, model context protocol. Model MCP. Yeah. 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 yeah well, A to A is considered a competitor, in some according to some analysts, to MCP. Okay. And because the data, the, you know, the the data um, from a company like Salesforce or Oracle can more readily integrate it into a Google type of environment than an environment that is an open source project started by like Anthropic. Sure. And so that was why I was asking because you bring up A to A, so I was wondering yeah. what you thought about MCP. No, that's fair. Um, I think, so I'll say I, I, we have not, I have not been personally as involved in a model context protocol and how we're actually gonna architect solutions against it. The concept though of each of these agents need to connect and talk to each other. They need to actually hold an understanding of what the answer they had. They, that, and that's, that's where that, I guess, the context comment comes from as we pass the solution, or the, the actual part of the problem along from agent to agent. Um, I think open source is fantastic. I think it's a great, it has its position. I think A to A from a Google perspective uh, allows it to have a bit more, well, I'm excited because of where we have places that are already Google Shops, they can grab onto the, the Google A to A protocol. And then we have, candidly, I've seen a lot of the ISVs are getting on the uh, A to A protocol bandwagon and thinking that's the path forward. But the reality is, is that we're, we're new in the market, right? Everything's new in the market. So we're going to see how this evolves and changes. Um, and AI has been changing rapidly in the last year. I think even before we started this interview, we were talking like, the solutions that were introduced a year ago, some of our enterprises are just now starting to adopt. The things we saw in terms of the um, in terms of the keynote are already are, are, are advancing at rapid pace. So we've got to see how some of this stuff falls out over the next year to eighteen months yet. How do you see the technical development progressing in you know the clients that Google works with and Deloitte works with? What are you seeing from them in terms of adoption of LLMs, and now agents? We had a number of our clients that were first to market. And it was a go through and say, I want to go and investigate, are these use cases, can I actually get value out of these use cases? And so in 2023 and 2024, it was heavy. Um, what can I do with it, and can I experiment with it? And I started pulling it in, and then started to say, can I build this into my enterprise architecture? 2024, we've seen, we're actually getting them into production and they're starting to consume them. Not at the scale I think that originally had thought. And so now 2025 is again, a, we believe that's the year where we're going to see productionalized scale of this. What they're, what they're finding and my clients are finding is they need optionality. It's not one LLM solves all the problems. I need more of a model garden and I need to be able to swap different LLMs based upon the type of problem that I have. It's also, we started very much of individual use case by use case. And the reality is, is if you just build by use case, it gets pretty expensive. And so that's turned to, I need an AI platform. And I need to actually have a place that all of my agents can run. And the more agents I build on that, I actually get efficiencies of scale. And so we're pivoting more towards, I need to build a platform for that. Kind of like a, a 
decades ago when we decided we needed an enterprise data warehouse. I'd originally had lots of different databases sitting around the enterprise. We started to consolidate that so I could manage my data in a very clear way. We're seeing the same thing happen with AI. So how do agentic frameworks fit in then? And that should end up being part of the um, platform. So my overall agentic framework in terms of I need a spe specific sets of capabilities, whether I need the actual UI that's part of it, I need a runtime framework, I need to actually have connectors. Um, I view that as all part of that AI platform and that's where we're going to get the value because if I have to plumb individual agents to every single one of my systems one off, it gets really expensive and it's hard to actually maintain and manage. And so as I get to this platform and I, I, my connectors, and I'll go back to Google's agent space, one of the really big powerful things I see in agent space is all the connectors. Because once I've plumbed it into each of my different systems, I can now turn on agents and use that plumbing to do things with it. Plumbing's an interesting term. It's been around in the community for a long time and one of the big problems with plumbing is it gets very complex. Yeah. So, you know, one of the biggest complexities we see is in configurations, right? And, you know, I'm curious on like how that complexity is going to be managed over time. Like how how do you see what you're doing now as addressing that complexity issue? At the end of the day, connecting applications 20 years ago was complex and today it's still complex and so that plumbing will end up being there. Uh, it will still end up being complex. If I at least have my AI platform and I have my connectors that I'm focused on managing and governing within, the, within, that applica or within that platform, I have better visibility to each of these different connections. But we had this similar problem when we were talking APIs just a few years ago when I needed to have an API catalog and I needed to actually monitor and manage that. I had telemetry. Um, that's where things like Apogee came into, came into play. I think it's a very similar type of thing that we'll have to manage with um, AI because ultimately we need to have applications of these agents talk to each other. And so that's where the ADA comes in. So yes. how does the ADA fit in with the framework? Uh, I see that overall our ADA ends up being a protocol. Framework says I need this type of a capability. The protocol is actually the way that they've instantiated that capability. Does that create then the capability for autonomous agents? It like should. Where agents can talk to each other? Yes. Have you seen that yet? We're getting there. Um, we still have human in the loop in the majority of our agents that are customer facing or they're not customer facing. Like at the end of the day, we, most of our clients don't want to end up in the Wall Street. We've seen a couple of missteps years, uh, you know, that have happened. Oh. It's a, I don't have, I don't want the risk associated with turning on an agent yet. So I keep a human in the loop to make sure that it's a, an ability for the human to say, I, I don't agree with that and, and that solution. That's not to say we won't get there. And I think in the next 12 months, we're going to see more and more autonomous agents. Uh, and even autonomous agents that are talking to customers, they're external facing. And so, what does that mean for a company who has a giant workforce that has a lot of engineers on staff? Uh, I think it's a good thing. So at the end of the day, AI is a tool. I view every time that we have new tooling that goes into place, we advance the enterprise. And typically it also advances our employees and it allows them to have additional skill sets and capabilities that are built on this. How are you anticipating issues like technical debt from Ooh. Agentic AI? Uh, it needs to be managed and it's going to be there. But I'll say, one of the things that we're finding with AI is we're actually able to work through technical debt, prior technical debt, faster. So, in fact, I just got a call from a client. They have 300 applications that have absolutely no documentation. It's written on Pascal and they don't understand what the application does. And we're using AI to actually unpack that and start to build the requirements directly off of old code. That's pretty interesting of how we could advance it because before we used to have to hire Pascal programmers if we didn't have them on staff and actually go through and document and code it. So we're finding ways to accelerate that. End of the day though, you're right. Agents will have to be, will be created then they will be monitored, and then they will have to be deprecated because what we built today may not necessarily be exactly what you want in two years or in five years, and so they will have to be managed no different than any other application that we have today. But you'll have hundreds of thousands of them, or even millions. Perhaps, but we'll also have the telemetry around it to see is the agent actually doing things. The telemetry, so talk about that. Yeah. I, probably too fancy of a word of basically what's the agent doing, how often is it being called, how many times is it, is it actually providing Well, it's very output. important to engineers, right? It telemetry is. is a very big topic. Yeah. Yeah, so is the telemetry good enough? 
I think that it goes back to you know, your AI framework and ultimately your platform. I need to be able to land agents in a place that I can execute them, initiate them, and monitor what they're doing, and I need that in a central place that a team can manage that. In all this, one of the topics I'm hearing a lot about, we heard it in like when we saw the Wizard of Oz uh, at the Sphere. Yeah. And how AI was able to like learn from what it saw in the, in the, the uh, frames from the original movie so they could determine what was not in the frame. So AI in AI, essentially. And I've heard this theme, too, discussed in other ways at, at the event. For instance, uh, people talking about learning, uh, learning uh, how to develop software uh, by using AI as the, as the pair, right? Mm -hmm. So they're learning it with the AI agent, that's the, the pair, so that's the, like, that's the new pair programming, right? I've heard it also in other ways, right, where we're talking about, for instance, uh, Google has a Gemini Live Reporter, where essentially like, the, the, you're talking to the AI and it's, and, it's, and it's, you're basically having a conversation with it that you could publish as a podcast, for instance, right? So this concept of pairing, um, is this something you all talk about? Because I'm hearing it come up you know, from Google and from others too. So I'm gonna, I'll give you my perspective and answer, and maybe it's, uh, I think it's aligned on pairing. We've built a couple of AI-enabled applications that really look at an entire business process, and we call it AI Assist. And it's again, it's a part of, it's not using the agent to go autonomously and do things on its own, it's actually, the engineer and the product owner are using these agents at different points in the overall software development lifecycle process to help accelerate and do things that, candidly, we should be doing anyway. So as an example, we'll start with a business requirement. We'll use AI to actually break that business requirement down into um, stories. And then those stories, we use AI to actually groom, it goes to the backlog from what we've done for the last five years. And the AI will tune the stories based upon history. So it'll find how we've done logging before and actually build those pieces in. And then it will take those stories, the human has an ability to change it because maybe it doesn't come out perfect. Then we can take that and we actually start building test cases, not just positive, but also negative. And we always should be doing both positive and negative test cases, but in every one of my projects, that's a place where sometimes you may not necessarily do it as much. And so that the pairing concept, what we see it is it helps drive more efficiency to actually drive delivery of the process as designed, and we're getting better, higher quality output because we're doing more testing. We have more information related to the product stories. And one of the things we built on this, which I, I used to be a programmer decades ago and I never had it, but we'd have the requirement. You never actually had a connection from the requirements um, repository into the IDE to code it. And we're actually making that connection now. And then we get into the IDE and we use AI to actually break that requirement down into a bunch of steps, almost pseudocode like. And then we start coding that. So that concept of AI accelerating, we still have engineers and our existing staff, but it's giving them the ability to be more efficient. We get more accuracy out of it. We get higher quality output. That's a really interesting kind of take on what you were just saying there and the, about, uh, you know, the, the you know, how you think about that workflow, really, right? And how you manage that. Uh, Kevin, I want to thank you very much for taking the time. This really enjoyed fun. our conversation. Thank you so much. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.